The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. Welcome to the seventh collection of half a dozen scores from the website entrance for the 2021 Orchestration Challenge. This is a real exciting collection of scores. They've all been fascinating, fairly unique, I would say. Uh, <clears throat> lots of different approaches and I'm so happy that this particular uh, this this particular example really helped to show the uniqueness of each orchestrator. So I think I picked <laughs> I think I picked a good example. Now, in the case of Chris's entry, Chris, you <laughs> submitted the full score, right? You, you you orchestrated all the way through, and for that amount of effort, I mean, I I really wish that I could return, you know, that effort uh, and and evaluate the entire score with you. And, but um, I, I can only do that at the Patreon level. So like, so if you're going to put that much effort into something, and obviously this was an important score for you because you did such a great job on it and you put a lot of care into it. Um, I, I think, you know, consider that uh, in maybe for 2022. All right, so let's talk about this entry, this sort of beginning section here, um, section A. <clears throat> so uh, starting off, we have the concern of pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano. That's not a big problem because you're spreading out the, the harmony a bit. It's not, it's not quite as big as it could be, but I mean, you're going all the way down to B below middle C here in the cellos and so on. So it's not, it's not quite so limited to the upper register. And here you start to stretch out a little bit more, right? Um, you know, with the bassoons and so on and the cellos and yeah. So, it, I mean, it's still sort of upper middle registry, but it's, but it's not, you know, it's not really like confined to the kind of more uh, the you know just being bright all the way through and and not really having a lot of guts to it. It does have some guts to it. Now, uh, before we dive into everything, I'm just going to make a few comments about the scoring of the harp. <clears throat> now, the way that you've got this worked out here, I think that you may have left out a different dynamic uh, marking here, right? So like you're 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 obviously taking pains to make sure the harp will be heard, right? You've got fortissimo scored on the harp, but mezzo forte in the strings, pizzicato. <clears throat> I think for a good balance, you should mark everything mezzo forte, or just maybe forte poco on your flute solo at the beginning here, and then mezzo forte of these entrances here, pushing towards. I don't think you need to go to fortissimo. Just go to forte, and then back down to, and then and then you can you can just stay there and then just boom go to uh go to fortissimo because like i think you want a terrace dynamic here you know you want it to be big and loud then dropping back big and loud dropping back but you know look i mean 
the care that you took, I really appreciate. You know, you, you're taking a lot of my lessons to heart, or you, you've you've absorbed the same things that I've been saying um, in your own way. Uh, but you know, keeping the the big percussion and brass back, you sort of balancing them against the strings and winds. It's great, right? Now, the concern about <clears throat> thematic material possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated exactly the same way twice um that's that is definitely a concern here but uh, you know i mean i, I mean I, i'm i appreciate the approach that you're taking here so it's it's not necessarily a minus but it's just something that for you to think about right whether or not you want the exact same approach both times there is a few there are a few things to talk about in this regard if you really go to Quivre with your horns, they are going to be blasting. They're going to be massive, okay? And you've got them playing some of the same pitches as trumpets and trombones and so on. So you, you just have to decide, like, you know, whether you want that really incredibly bright grinding sound or just to have, like, regular old horns, right? Uh, because they, that will tend to overbalance once again, right? And, and Quivre... You're really talking forte, fortissimo, and so on. And, of course, then you're adding accents on top of that. So you're having this punchy, um, almost fortissimo kind of a sound, and the winds and the brass have got to compete against that. And, you know, they just they, they don't have the strength, really. So it's one one instance where I think, like, you could, like, like there are so many accents on, on everything from, you know, as you've imported them from the piano part. So, you know, do we need that many? And then right here, you've got a string of down bows, but you've got accented staccato, right? So does the articulation style match the bowing style? So normally you think of um, sol, <clears throat> um, the Italian term, um, sorry, it's, it's escaping me. I've been... I've been evaluating scores all day, so my brain is um, is slightly scrambled. But um, yeah, just kind of using the frog, am frosch. See, like the German is popping into my head. So yeah, so that's it's a sort of a zoom kind of sound. You're kind of going zoom, 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 right? It isn't just it isn't just like um, a string of down bows, but there's there's more to it than that. You really are like. Um, you know, there's a there's a kind of an aggressive push, and so like that with that shoving sound. Um, do you really want, you know, shove, 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 right? Which is longer than a staccato, right? But if you get rid of that, then you just get yep, 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 bup, 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 right? It's like it's it's like almost like a barking dog, ruff, 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 which is not the same thing as zoom, 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 right? Is the because you're using the full length of the bow, you usually like this, you know, so it's, it's, it's the two things are working against each other, right? It, usually this is marked over a tenuto rather than over an accented staccato. I mean, you can still have the accents, but yeah, um, you know, is, is it really, you know, like it, you're getting like a, sh you would, you're, you're basically asking them to go zzz, and like there's a, there's a kind of a scent that like that with a staccato, there's a sense of kind of stopping the bow, right, rather than than necessarily lifting it, right, which is a different effect. So, um, and then saltato or saltando works against the whole idea of um, <laughs> the the you know the constant down bows too, right. So so you have to think about you know when you're adding a new articulation style, right. Does that match up with the articulation style that you are starting with? But I mean. <sighs> I, I mean, there, there's there's ways around it. I think it would just like getting rid of the staccatos, but then you just you have to be aware that what you end up with here is not really matching everybody else, right? So you have those two things working along different trains. So will they work together is the question. All right. Um, but, you know, the placement, like the general um, orchestration as it is, is is okay. You know, it's it, it works works fine. Um, you know, the placement of the parts and so on and so forth, like not, no, no big, huge problems. Um, so yeah, it, it's just a lot of snare. I'm just kind of noticing that really that the snare seems a bit 
like you know we're talking about this section being relentless and we're going to get to it in a bit um so like i think the snare drum is what makes it feel relentless right that it's the you know just it really is a lot of pacing maybe this could be tambourine instead or castanets or some other instrument that you know has a has a kind of a character to it right has a has a characteristic kind of a feel okay so um so that brings us to the next concern and that is the treatment of the melody and the accompaniment figures right in here so so once again the harp works right so you've got fortissimo harp mezzo forte pizzicato uh, sparsely scored in the strings and then just you know this lone little flute um part i would say you get a way better sound here if you just go with the with the first flute player right that that's just so much better like um you know almost kind of like having mindless fun and then uh and then i think here you you got the you got the melody slightly wrong right not it doesn't doesn't walk down in a scale it it um it um it basically plays a like a um it's a it's an arpeggiation of a of a chord right so um yeah like a um i think a d minor seventh so yeah so so watch out for that that's a that might be a transcription error or maybe you are rebooting it or something like that but anyways it doesn't sound right this is kind of cool the way that the piccolo comes in and takes over and so on and the clarinets come into or the cla first clarinet comes into support from below so i just i think that's all the more reason why this should be uh solo flute right so just have its first flute all the way through to here and then you have the second flute coming in uh, that all works great right and then fix the uh fix the turn the turn this scale into an arpeggio all right so so that works great and then this this kind of scoring right in here with the harp works good too. Yeah, that's fine. I would say, you know, there's no reason to go up to forte here with your pizzicato. Go back to forte. Uh, excuse me. Go back to mezzo forte. And same thing here. Drop down to mezzo forte. Seriously. And then the harp will shine through beautifully. And then here, you can start to put on the pressure. You know, maybe crescendo to a forte, and then so on. And then at that point, you're leaving out the harp. <clears throat> and then right in here, like the harp is kind of invisible, right? So, like, so what, what was scored beautifully here for the right reasons, right, becomes uh, kind of pointless right here and going forward. So there's no way that the harp can possibly be heard through this kind of din, right? That the harp is the gentlest instrument in the orchestra, except for maybe the celesta. They're, they're very similar in terms of their limited range of, of power. Right, so you have to really pick the right moment. So, it almost you know, right in here, this is almost like sort of piano scoring, right? But I mean, you're you're doubling other pitches which are doing the job fine, and and make you know, it makes even less sense, right, to have forte horns, fortissimo snare drum, and then expect a harp to come through, right? If it weren't for the fact that everything else would already drown it out. So, you know, so, you know, choose your harp moments wisely. And here you did. It was beautiful and it worked great and for all the right reasons. But I'd, I'd say, like, also drop these lines to, you know, I would say forte poco on the, um, you know, starting out here. And then mezzo forte crescendo to fortissimo is, or mezzo forte crescendo to forte maybe. You don't have to go to fortissimo right away. Yeah, just really save it up, right? Okay, <clears throat> and then you know the the use of the piccolo that really helps out with the the whole problem of the melodic development soaring quite high and so on and and these other lines coming in it all felt very seamless and and you should be recommended you know like you should be commended for that it was really nicely done good thinking on that <clears throat> and you know the brass isn't scored uncomfortably high you know just really you know good you know good foresight. Um, good use of like more natural idiomatic scoring. All right, so right in here, you know, we get into the whole point of like, does it feel relentless if the upper middle if the upper middle texture continues on, right? If there's no textural contrast, so I would say you get fairly close to that problem, right? You know, like you you're leaving out your heavy brass right in here, 
but you still have that snare drum just bashing away, right? And then you've got like the whole combination of winds, horns, and strings in similar registers, right? They're all in similar registers to what they were doing before. So, so it, it just really kind of feels like after a while, even though it's all really good scoring and <clears throat> all very powerful, strong, you know, satisfying, uh, rewarding to listen to, you know, is, is it just kind of much of a muchness, right? Like, is it, is it, uh, is it, is it too much of a good thing, right? Or too much of the same good thing. And then, you know, pushing forwards, like here, Molto Mercado, this is just really, you know, it's very simple, very well done, you know, and, and you, you use exactly the same strategy as me in mine. Like I went to unison violins here and then the lower strings coming in um, and, and taking us forwards to the next thing. Um, I, I think I doubled my, my part with some wins as well to make it really extra pointy, but you know, this, this works great. And what happens, you know, what follows on the next page is great and I would really love to talk about it. So like, you know, next time you put this much work into something, you know, if, if you feel like it, it really deserves the full treatment from me, then, you know, I, I am happy to do it. Right. So just, just consider supporting on Patreon next time. And, you know, um, and, you know, and, and of course I understand people can't always afford to do that or it isn't right for them or, you know, they might not feel, that that Patreon is is something that fits their particular outlook, and and I appreciate that. I'm not pressuring anybody to do it. And you know, um, if you're happy just to have this first page, then I'm happy too. I'm I just, you know, slightly bothers me <laughs> um, that you put so much work into it, and I and I and I kind of can't talk about it. So um, anyway, um, so I I think this is really well done. I think you've got some great instincts as an orchestrator. I think you've got some good craft as well. Uh, you know, you, you know, if you've been, if, if some of these decisions were influenced by my, um, by some of my writings and, and previous lectures and so on, then, then that's great. I, you know, I, I would feel, uh, honored by that. Uh, that's, that's fine. Uh, a few little things like you don't need to trade off so much, you know, between first and second, like you're, you're not going to use up your your first player's focus or concentration or anything like that. I mean, I see what you're doing in here. You know, your your clarinet player is playing kind of high, um, and so you know, thinking, well, come in here like that's sort of in the register of the second, and then you know, then trading off, and it's kind of strange though. See, because here you're going to second voice. Like, what is second voice and what is first voice, right? So if this really is second voice, then these should be flipped, right? Sort of like, um, kind of like this, right? So that maintains the position of the second below and then the first above, and then you can swap them again and so on. But it's just a little unclear the way that this was done. So anyway, um, great score, really fun to look at. Thank you so much uh, for bringing this into the, uh, the website entries. Much appreciated, quality work. Now on to the next entry. Right, and now for Aereo's score. Now, this is this is very, very cool, very huge, um, come, kind of stompy, you know, in a good way. Uh, this is taken from music that has a lot of stomping in it. So, um, you know, just a few a few comments about general approaches to scoring here. Um, I don't think it's necessary to trade off between the, these two parts. I would say just have your first first and second horns play this not first and third so like you've got one and three two and four but the natural partners in this kind of playing are first and second or third and fourth right because you have the you have the first player who is kind of leading not only leading the section but also leading the pair of horns right the it's it's not just that like you should always give um 
the first and third a chance to play together because you know you just assume that they are natural partners in certain scoring but it's not true it's, that's not true at all um the the whenever you have a situation where there are intervals that need to be tuned exactly right uh and there is like partnered playing uh, then then it really is the first and the second because they can rely on each other the the strongest now the first and the third is a good pairing when you have like really high emphatic scoring. Like if you had wanted this line to be doubled, right? Uh, or right in here, see this is good first and third scoring, uh, but it could also be first and second with absolutely zero problem, right? Uh, it would be perfectly fine. Uh, you do have some low scoring in here though, so that's better to give to the second and the fourth. But generally speaking, you know, and, and then here, like it seems like you're not really sure of like what to do because right in here you've got the like the third playing I guess a second part right so you had not quite worked it out right um, generally speaking if you are in you know if you if you really intend your your horn scoring to be stronger then you know really just just score things one and two three and four and then see how the parts will end up lying across the staves I think scoring one and three, two and four as a default just kind of leads to, um, I'm not going to say bad habits, but just you know potentially questionable decisions in scoring, right? Like there's, for instance, there's nothing, there, there's absolutely zero wrong here of uh, putting like this B, which would be a second part, right? So so the first on F sharp, the second on B in the same staff, right? And then you have the D sharp being played um being being played in a rhythmic pattern uh, above the held b right so you know it's like it's it, it looks exactly the same so I, I don't really see a justification except for like maybe here for scoring these on the same staff and then not even here right you could have the like you're you're thinking oh well this you know this has to be in bass clef and so on but it doesn't right the the both these parts these these d's could be scored just with ledger lines below the first. It's perfectly fine. Okay, so with that little horn rant over, <laughs> there's one other thing too, and that is that this um, this raspberry that you've got here, wow, by the by the trombones, it is going to just really stand out in in this. You know, it's just going to be this big growl, it, like even at mezzo forte, right? Uh, it 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 will really stand out and be audible. And um, you may be a trombonist, so I, I don't. So please excuse me. This is not intended at all to be um, to to be trombone splaining to you. Okay, so I apologize. But just say let's just make sure. Look at the chart of um, of glissando of like trombone possible dr trombone glissandos in one hundred more orchestration tips, and you know just see whether or not that works. I would just say, like, make sure that just make sure to check on those kinds of things to make sure that you can cover that distance in a natural way. Um, there's there's ways of faking glissandos if they're kind of covering, you know, if, if you're sort of sliding up to one and then switching over to another position and then sliding forwards. Uh, so it's a slightly unnatural, but it still works. But when you're going back and forth, it really is better to make sure that you're within the bounds, right? So. You don't, you know, you don't have to explain below if if it, if it is or isn't. Just like, just make sure that I'm just saying, you know, whether you got it right or not. Just, just everybody out there, make sure if you're going to do this kind of gesture that it's all within the um, the scope of one slide, right? Without having to change position because it's just it would be a hassle to go back and forth uh, otherwise. So, um, so now let's talk about the. Uh, evaluation criteria as applied to this score and <clears throat> you know that the, the question is like pitch weight in the upper metal middle register of the piano slash orchestra it's not a not an issue uh, thematic material repeating often possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated exactly the same way throughout well I mean it's the same basic orchestration for the winds and strings and then just adding brass, right, to make it bigger. So, so that you know that kind of gets you off the hook, right? Um, however, you know, does it really sound different, right? Did did the addition of the brass really make the two parts sound significantly different, right? Or did it just make it sound a little bigger? 
right? So, so you know, maybe think about those kinds of things, like whether or not, uh, you know, there are certain ways you could con- you could contrast it a little bit more obviously, or a little bit more, um, you know, one part building on the other in a way where you know just really brings certain things into relief. I really love the castanet right in there. I think that that works great. Tambourine and castanet working together, super. Um, and then of course you get all the stompy kind of uh, feeling from your um, from bass drum, timpani, tuba, contrabassoon. Right, it just really makes a heavy, heavy, heavy footprint. Right. So is there and, and that footprint sort of remains throughout. That there's just so much stomping and and thumping around. So maybe like a one way of contrasting this that is even more effective than just adding brass is what if you withheld that stomping and just added a certain amount, like, you know, maybe just the downbeat, boom, dun, 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 yet da, 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 boom, dun, 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 yet da, dun, dun, and then come back and go stomp, 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 dun, 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 dun. Do you know what I mean? Like maybe that is a, a way of, of making the variation sound a little bit more, uh, more clear, right? Uh, you know, I mean, other than that, there's there's nothing too insane here <laughs> in your orchestration. I mean, it it's very very big, dense, bright in the middle. Um, you know, and and yeah, I mean, it, it's the the placement of the pitches and everything. That's all all fine. Now here, like, um, we're kind of seeing uh, okay two problems here. So so we there's there isn't a staccato. Right. So the whole concept of going down bow, down bow, down bow, down bow, altalone. That's what I was trying to think in my in my brain last uh, last evaluation. For some reason, it just disappeared. The problem is, like, can you do a accent slurred to another accent and a big, huge shoving down bow? Right. I think you're just adding too much stuff to this. You're complicating it way too much. Leave the grace notes with the other players, right? The winds and the brass. And then just let your players just do this big, you know, these big down bows, vroom, 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 right? Um, and, and, then, and then just seriously, don't go staccato on this. And in fact, don't do a down bow here either. Go down, 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 up, da, 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 down, 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 up, up, down, up. Right. That's that would be the way that I would I would work this out as a concert master, which I was for a short time for my student orchestra back in junior high school, middle school. But I, you know, I wasn't given any responsibility other than to just get my parts right. So. Um, so getting to this, you know, our alternating sections, um, I, I would kind of have the same comments as I did on the previous evaluation. And that is really just make a, you know, terrace your dynamics much more obviously, right? So just big, 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 da, 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 and then softer, right? Just maybe mezzo forte or, or forte poco or something. Because, like, look, you've got mezzo forte here, right? So it kind of suggests to me that this whole section should be softer to begin with, so that you have a bit of a contrast, right? You're going forte piano, sforzando, fortissimo, right? So, like, and then this is forte. So this might not be needed in here, this big push right in here. So yeah, and and then the, then the same thing here. Like this, the, this could also pull back and contrast, so that it isn't just like otherwise you just have fortissimo stomping throughout the entire thing. You know, there's like no relief, and um, like here you're like I guess you're dropping to forte here. Why can't you drop to forte here and then crescendo from the middle back to fortissimo, right? I just feel that that you need more dynamic contrast in here because you're you're sort of using up the listener's goodwill. Right, by continuing to be so powerful all the way through, and it's not just that you're powerful because that's not a big critique for some other evaluations, but it's just because you're powerful and so full-blooded, like so much 
um, so much weight in the base and and so on, right? So so yeah, so you know, I would just say, look, mark like you've got the forte marking down here in the base, so like that should be all the way through, or or even like mezzo forte or forte poco, right? So just like really bring it back, and then push back in, and then you're loud again. Okay. So, um, of course, I'm leaving out the whole question of melodic development, like going quite high. And I really love the idea of the, um, uh, you know, of, of these parallel thirds. And then, you know, the piccolo coming in and just really getting the highest of the pitches. And I think that, you you know, it's just a little odd that there is... You know, you know that, that that there's no doubling in the strings. It's like there's you'll you'll end up having a string sound combined with this, but no real leadership from the violins at all, right? So if you really want a combined string sound, there's a couple of different options. One is um, divisi firsts doubling this and playing the same thirds and so on, or a divisi octaves. I think, I think that would be the strongest option. So Divisi octaves just playing this, and then and then it could um, telescope back into a single line here. Uh, but you know, but I, I think that otherwise it's just like the strings are almost, you know, they're nominal. They're they're really not contributing a lot, right? And then and then here, like we have the strings being so much more powerful, but then you don't have any doubling from the winds on the lower voice in the violas. While you have these English horn, the English horn player is not doing anything, right? So why can't the English horn player play this, right? It's right in their range, perfect, good, a good octave doubling with the first flute and good support for that line below. Uh, and you know, just the the in whole in the terms of the um, the accompaniment figures, you've got a lot of your own ideas, like this kind of roaring, sort of um, diving contrapuntal motion right in here uh, along with the actual accompaniment figures that Faya put in so that's all you know just a wonderful cacophony but I mean do you need it to be this do you need it to be that strong to you know Sforzande Sforzando Fortissimo right do you really need to just really because it sort of distracts from everything else that's going on in there. But I mean, I, that's kind of fun in another way. Bum, 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 bum. Rawr, dun, 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 that's kind of fun. But, you know, I would just say watch out. Just think about yourself whether or not you're overdoing. Think about it to yourself whether or not you're overdoing things. This is a, this is absolutely a fourth horn part, not a third horn part. Right. Okay. Um So, uh, moving forwards, um, then you've got this harmonized run up to the top, right? So, you know, you're dealing with the, um, with the very super high notes that, you know, and here you don't need, you don't need the ottava mark here. That's all good. Just, <clears throat> just score it out, um, you know, with the ledger lines, you're fine. Going all the way to that high E. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, of course you have limited space here vertically so that's fine that you threw in the ottava but in the parts you know you might want to just uh uh just leave it leave it leave the uh, ottava out and put it in put in the actual pitches so there's kind of nothing all that wrong about how this is scored either you yeah, know that's fine uh and you know i like the uh, contrary motion. I think the contrary motion needs more support from the brass and the um, and the lower uh, lower winds, right? It's because like you've got this really critical motion right in here, right? And you've got some of that being doubled by the contrabassoon, but like, uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of doesn't make any sense for you to be going for you to be scoring this and then jumping down. But then already having the octave below because like there's no sense of downward motion, right? You're you're taking that away by having the contrabassoon so low from the beginning. So I would just say double this, right, and then have the motion going similar, right? That way we really can see that it is going downwards and it isn't just going around in a circle, right? So that needs to be doubled to think a little bit more effectively in the lower winds, right? You've got. Um, 
yeah, just, just a little bit of rearranging of some of the pitches in here. All right, so that leads us right to here. Boom. Dun, dun, dun. Yep, up, 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 up. You know, it, fairly nicely done, right? I mean, but like the sense of relentlessness is starting to settle in, isn't it? Just like, you know, the of the of that same power, right? Um, you know, why couldn't you like rush up to this big fortissimo and then pull back in terms of the color as well as and and the and the thickness of the texture uh, along with the dynamics, right? And like maybe ease up on so many accents everywhere all the time, right? Um, you, you can just you can get the same effect, right? You know, Faya is trying to get a certain kind of of intensity of sound from the piano, right? But the piano does not, you know, you can play an accent on the piano, and there is nothing about that accent that, you know, as you after you hold the the note down, the accent doesn't have the same effect as an accented string or wind. Or brass note, right? Like with an accent with a brass note, you get the spike, and then they pull back, and then shape the note, and then shape the note at the on the, you know, they shape the decay and the and the release of the note, right? So there's this, um, there's this spike, right? And then, but that doesn't happen on the piano. With the piano, there's, you know, if you accent a note, you're hitting it hard, and then there's a decay from there, right? So it's a different, it's a completely different kind of a sound. So what I'm just saying is like there do not there do not have to be so many accents everywhere all the time from a note that, from a score like this that has got a lot of accents in it. Might be better just to mark dynamics, right? And then let the music take care of itself, right? And just like save the accents for really really emphasized notes. But I mean, you know, having said that, I had a lot of accents in my score too, so you know, I'm I'm one to talk, right? Um so yeah, keeps going and then we've got this so are we still fortissimo here right mezzo piano molto marcato this seem to not be too you know so mezzo piano and molto marcato how does that work right so to really think about like you know if you change the context of the of the dynamics you know first of all is that universal is that just one single thing like who is going to hear these low notes? You know, they're just going to be sort of in the background as the strings continue to furiously play these staccatos, right? So, so maybe you need a diminuendo leading to a softer section, and then a push right in here from all instruments, right? So, uh, but yeah, but I mean, this this appears to connect to something. So I would say like you could transition from this into something else. Maybe maybe the timpani is a little bit much there, eh? What if, um, what if you just had like, um, like tuba and contrabassoon octaves or tuba and bass clarinet or something or bass clarinet and contrabassoon instead of tuba and playing softly. And then, um, instead of, instead of timpani, uh, which really has this bouncy pounding sound, what if it was, um, um, pizzicato and the double basses instead, which has got a subtler, uh, sound, but it's just a question. Do you want to, do you want this to be paced? Really, you know, do you want the feeling of the strings just running away with the music, or do you really want this bump, a bump, a bump, a bump, a bump, a bump, a bump? You know, so you see, on something like you're really telling us where the notes are, as opposed to just where where are these people going? Stop them quick, right? Rain them in. What's what's going on? So you're sort of taking away that sense of wildness when you are pacing every single beat, right? And sometimes more than every, uh, you know, pacing all the eighth notes, right? So so just watch out for that because I'm not sure that it is adding to the momentum of this. I think it more that it's kind of slowing, it's kind of taking, it's adding inertia rather than momentum. All right, but, you know, other than all of those quibbles <laughs> and possible ways of improving things and insights and, and comparisons and everything else, Great, really great job, right? You know, like, I, I you know, I, I do have a lot of feedback to give these scores, but it doesn't mean that the people who worked on them didn't, you know, A, didn't know what they were doing, B, couldn't, uh, couldn't orchestrate. Not far from it. There, I'm seeing some great examples of orchestration in here and just really, you know, really solid scoring. It's just like, 
uh, what, what's great about that is that I can talk about orchestration on a higher level, right? Not going, not breaking down every single note in an orchestration and saying, you know, is, is, is it good to put bass clarinet here or there or whatever. But, you know, having a, a view from above and thinking about the proportions of things, right? Which I think is like even more important, <laughs> right? It's, you know, it's okay to get one or two notes possibly, you know, a little weaker or stronger in the texture so long as you are um, thinking about the bigger picture, like the, the, the view from above, right? Rather than inside the forest, but above, you know, sort of looking down on the landscape, right? So, and, and, you know, for this score giving me that opportunity, I'm hugely grateful. And I really thank you so much for sending me this fantastic bit of work. And uh, <clears throat> really, you know, makes me wonder how, how you would orchestrate the 2022 uh, entry, which I've already got picked out. <coughs> I may actually be scoring myself soon. So uh, just just to just to think about it, giving myself more time because, you know, just like this piece, it is a masterpiece. And I want to be absolutely sure that I get, you know, that I have all my ducks in a row and I'm able to give you guys something worth looking over as an orchestration lesson next year. So thank you so much. And now on to the next entry. That's a very cool score, Ramses. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> okay, so how can I help you with this? Let's look at the harp part first. So <clears throat> here you have uh, some interesting balance uh, issues. You've marked your violins, uh, your, your string section, as mezzo forte for the first eight bars. And you have your winds at forte. So really you know and right in here where there's a where there's a big crescendo you don't have any crescendo for your your strings so the problem here is <clears throat> that that the winds are already much louder than the strings so you know they they will find their balance usually but that will entail the winds pulling back a little or the strings playing out a little right so you're it's really better to have the uh, winds and strings playing at the same dynamic, okay? But <clears throat> that isn't all. <laughs> um, there is also the issue of the, the harp, getting back to the harp, right? So <clears throat> in this kind of scoring, <clears throat> we have a situation where this second beat is accented by horns, winds, pizzicato, strings in triple stops. And these triple stops are all very playable, by the way. That's pretty good, actually. Um, this is not quite so much, but I mean, it's still doable, but not the, not the funnest thing to play. However, <clears throat> the, the more, they will more or less work. But to get back to here, the, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the more weight you put on this second beat, the less we'll be able to hear the harp. And especially if you're giving the harp the same dynamic as everybody else. Now, if everybody were playing mezzo forte and the harp were playing fortissimo with a big, huge roll, with a very, very big scoring throughout, uh, very, a very gushing chord, like maybe hand over hand, right? You had something like there was left hand, right hand, left hand uh, going over the top then we could really hear that chord. But as it is here, it, it just basically is like a pizzicato chord, right? It's, it has the same, it has the same length, but since the harp is so much softer than pizzicato strings, you really won't be able to hear the harp, you know, let alone having it covered by these winds, which are, are going to be even louder than the pizzicato, especially as you've scored them with a softer dynamic, right? So 
<clears throat> I'm not saying that all of your harp scoring here is not going to work. I think that you have some good ideas here. I would say, though, like some things aren't going to work or they aren't really going to be heard. <clears throat> For instance, uh, these low E's are just going to be swallowed up by the pizzicato in the lower strings. And then these chords here are going to be absorbed by the pizzicato string, the pizzicato violins, right? So it, it's, um, yeah, it's a little, it's a little dubious. Now, th so, so, you know, once again, big wide rolls work very, very well. Glissando works well. And I would say with this glissando, you should have your, you know, it's 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 a fast tempo, but it's not it's still not that fast. You should make your glissando as wide as possible. <clears throat> I would just say go to the the lowest possible string, you know, your lowest E, and then have a glissando up an octave higher than this, right? Just really cover a lot of ground because otherwise it's really kind of like da -da 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 -da. it really is not fast enough to brum. This is really what you want. You want that big sweep. So I would say make your glissando wider, right? Make it as wide as you possibly can in this kind of in this kind of scoring. It's kind of strange. You've got you've got a lot of different dynamic you know, I mean, you've got a lot of different dynamic ideas here. Uh, there isn't really a big consistent um, emphasis here on... I mean, you know, you've got your melody forte, right? <laughs> and then you've got this sweeping stuff, piano to forte and back. I'm assuming you're coming back. Like, here, here you're saying mezzo piano. So, you know, shouldn't you have a destination dynamic for this as well? Like piano, crescendo, and then back, or... I mean, I guess you don't really need it, but you, you would need it here since you're adding a dynamic in the middle. And then you have pushing these harmony parts in the horns and the lower strings, right? And then you have this other stuff, mezzo piano. And so I would say really try to have more integrated dynamics where the orchestra can move together because with this kind of thing, it, it really is sort of piecemeal. It I mean, you could get away with it in film scoring where everybody is miked, right? Where everybody has a microphone on them. Uh, but it's still... It, it just doesn't have a... Uh, the sound isn't really working together, and there will be some parts that will be very difficult to hear. Okay, so... <laughs> let's um, turn on the evaluation criteria. Hang on, Mike. Um, the battery on my old laptop is pretty, uh, is getting to the end of its life. All right. Okay, so, we don't have big concerns about uh, pitch weight being in the upper middle register because you are spreading it out, uh, adding some bass in there. And you're also leaving the bass out at the beginning, which I think is great, because that provides a contrast between this section and this section. I mean, you have a very similar approach between these two sections um, in your scoring. It's just you here you magnify what you're doing, and, and the, that magnification really, really works, especially with the emphasis uh, on the downbeat, right, With um, from lower instruments. That really makes a big difference. Okay, so... We have satisfied that criterion, and now we're also looking at melodic development. Soaring quite high, and here you have addressed that um, with, uh, <clears throat> with the piccolo coming in and just catching the top right in here. And uh, one thing I would say about your treatment of the melody is that it's really sparse. You know, you, you've got a uh, first flute taking the top of the line. So you've got no support from your uh, your first violins. And you've got <clears throat> you've got your oboes and clarinets working together. Um, 
doubling and playing below. I like the little trill. That's very cool. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 and so on. Yeah. Um, I think I think we're missing the tie here, right? It's da 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 tie. Ba 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 ba. Right. <clears throat> yeah, and see, and then right in here you have the second flute. Excuse me, you have the first flute take over the the um, lower line from the. Uh, from the first oboe and first clarinet. So that's cool, too. I like that. So it's kind of interesting that you've got this... Um, you've got the harmony here uh, repeating under it. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, so... Um, you know, the only thing you have to ask yourself is, will that make it staticky? You know, will it... will it um, or, or make it two-paced? You know, like as if I'm sort of pointing out every single possible... Um, you know, possible point in a on a ruler right of you know of all the different eighths that are in a bar but i mean it's look it's 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 the first time i'm seeing this in somebody's entry so um so to me it's very original and and very cool so i'm not going to tell you not to do it but i'm just saying you know always question uh, <clears throat> when you're changing the the basic um the pacing of a piece, just you know, always think about how much you know you're adding or subtracting. <clears throat> now, as far as the accompaniment figures go, right? That you you have basically just reinterpreted them. There is no that that's the other issue here is like the the sense of leaping around that we have in the piano part has been exchanged for this repetition right in here, and for more static chords in this section and you know of course the uh, the sort of rising upwards and coming back uh with these um with these runs and with the glissando <clears throat> so i mean it solves the problem <laughs> right in my list of criteria uh, by avoiding the entire subject and also i really like the fact that these uh sections are very differentiated as well so you know that it really just checks a lot of boxes. Uh, as far as the overall orchestration is concerned, it's you know it it is working fine, except for that problem that you've got with the harp kind of being invisible unless you clean it up a little bit. I would say big gushing um, chords, you know, hand over hand kind of big chords, are the only way you're going to you know you're going to have the harp contribute anything at all here, and then. Um, you know, like this, this for instance, is not going to come through at all. And most of the scoring right in here will not be heard by anybody but the harpist. And, you know, really, these really high chords are a great idea, right? But, like, with rolls, right? So I would say even make it bigger and, you know, like add a hand. Right? That's one thing about the harps when they roll chords. They can roll chords with three hands, four hands, right? It's just left over right over left over right. That kind of idea. So the more that that the more that you break up the chord with a big roll, the better chance it has of being heard. However, if you know even at that, if the accompaniment is strong enough, particularly in the brass and the percussion, then you still won't hear the the big rolls from the harp as or you barely hear them. All right, and then taking us forward kind of a last little look at the melodic development soaring quite high. Um, so here we're having the violins coming in finally. Um, I'm just going to back up here and check on something. You see, here you're saying violas, and here you're saying a violin, or alto violin. Maybe that's the same thing as a viola. So it's kind of strange. Um, the proper abbreviation for violas is VLA period, right? So VLN, and here you should have VLN1, VLN2. Yeah, and then contrabassoon, right? So there's some, some strange stuff going on here. Um, this, this is one reason why I like double bass as the term rather than contrabass. I just, you know, like, 
with either one though, should be CB or DB, right? So double bass DB, it's just, just the easiest thing to remember, I think, in English. And then, because contrabass can get mixed up with contrabassoon, and here we're seeing something like that right here in the um, in the abbreviation. So, um, so continuing on back to the back to the treatment of the melody, we have our alto violins coming in here and uh, playing in octaves with the violins and not really going all that high, right? And then the uh, bassoons are doubling the violas. You have me thinking altos now, like in French. And then the trumpet is doubling the uh, first violins. And here the the doubling is powerful enough to where the um, <clears throat> the trumpet does not feel like it is just dropping off, right? So that's a good trade-off that you've got there with the flute and the piccolo taking over. Uh, I would say that it would not hurt anything at all to have the piccolo start a little earlier. Um, because, you know, because it just sort of seems to come in from nowhere right here. So if you if you get tired of hearing that you know, in your mock-up, then I would say you just easily start your piccolo right here and don't worry about it being low because it's it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things starting on that A-sharp which isn't really all that audible. <clears throat> Anyhow, I mean, and if you're, you know, and, and if you are really worried about it, you can double it. Like you could have uh, your first flute playing the A sharp um, at concert pitch, and then of course the piccolo with the, with the octave transposition doubling each other, and then continuing on in a straight line with the piccolo and then dropping down with the flute. It would just make it, it would make your triple octave more consistent all the way through. Okay, now once again, um, this is not going to be audible, the, uh, the harp right in here. <clears throat> and, you know, the end of this glissando does not have very much power against this huge fortissimo stroke by everybody else. It just really, the harp is not really playing much of a role. You should finish your glissando, but you could just finish it on a single note and then just not even worry about the chord because nobody's going to hear it. Now here, right in here, like a fortissimo harp part, not forte, but fortissimo harp part, is going to have a chance in the first three beats of this phrase, right? Through to here. And then when you get to here, unless this is a big, big roll, you're not going to hear it against the, you know, trombones and horns and so on, right? Okay, I, th I, think, I'm, I think this has got to be another... Um, um, <laughs> This is going to be another topic for 12 more, uh, 12, 12 more um, common orchestration errors. So I'm just seeing it a lot. I'm not saying that, you know, that you are a common orchestrator <laughs> because this is a common error. But I'm just really seeing a lot of um, underpowered harp parts against big tutis. And it's, and it's unavoidable, right? You know, you, this open section, section A, is a big tutti section, you know, at least in my way of thinking. I look at it, it's fortissimo, it's exciting. Um, I want to score the whole orchestra there, and I just know that the harp isn't going to have much to say unless it does a specific kind of accompaniment, or unless I really drop the dynamic way down so that the harp has got a chance. If the Let's say that the orchestra was, was playing along at maybe mezzo forte, um, then the harp would have a chance above the action, you know, in the, you know, in the upper two octaves of the piano type of range. Patterns, uh, rolls, little, you know, little comments, those could come through um, if they had a if they had a certain motoristic energy to them. But yeah, but uh, you know, this this kind of thing. Is just you know unless it's a big roll, it's not going to come through with the uh, horns. Horns especially will absorb the sound of the harp. This has got a chance because it's basically just a, a written out roll. And then, but then right in here, you know, you might as well have like um, like um, glockenspiel 
if you need these kinds of accents and the, or this kind of support from above on your winds, it just you'll get a much better sound from glockenspiel than from harp. I, I mean, if your winds were way softer, right? But it's kind of strange, the dynamics here. Here you have forte, and you leave it at forte, and then you have diminuendo, and then you have forte again. So diminuendo to forte, right? The, 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 you know, this is what gets you raised hands at rehearsals. All right, well, let's focus on the evaluation criteria. <clears throat> so this is all really fun right in here. I really love the way that you re reinterpreted the harmony and, uh, and, and the accompaniment and all that. And then I just think it really, like, it helps the phrasing, right? Like you're really understanding the phrasing of the melodic gestures really well. Like ending right here, there's this is where that phrase comes to an end, and then starting the next phrase here, and then understanding that these are groups that start on the second beat and end on the first beat of the next bar. Well, that's that's really really great, and I and I love the way that you are orchestrating this out. You know, this is going to be very very bright above here. This is all going to work together with the upper strings and the upper winds. <clears throat> and then shifting to here, yep, up, 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 bum. Um, the only thing I would say in here is that there isn't a whole lot of variety between the like you know there isn't it isn't a conversation. It's it's a monologue, right? So it's a it's a monologue of these players, um, all working together of one type of sound, right? And then right in here, you've got a clarinet, right, or a clarinet. You've got one clarinet player. Um, playing this, and I, I see what you're doing here. You're bringing down the energy. <clears throat> yeah, but it, it is it is a bit of a shelf. Do you know what I mean? So you've got a lot of players playing here. You've got a couple less players playing here, and then you have suddenly one player, right? So there is going to be a bit of a drop-off, but you're facilitating that with having this rest in here. So I think that that is going to help to the ear to readjust to fewer players. And all right, and then we've got our final um, our final concern here and that is maintaining a driving staccato and transitioning smoothly into the next passage. And you give us just a few bars to show us where you're headed. And that, that's fine. That's the kind of thing that I totally don't limit. You know, I'm not going to say <clears throat> you know, don't score anything more than the than the amount prescribed for your level, for your level of entry. If you continue on and show us a bar or two of where you're going, that's fine. And of course, some people will orchestrate the entire thing, but just want feedback on the opening section. And that's fine too. So yeah, so here, you know, you are, it's a little, you know, it, it's, it's one of these things where you are, uh, the dynamics are a little inconsistent here, right? Forte, this is still forte, that's mezzo forte, and then here you have a diminu diminuendo to me mezzo piano. But this is mezzo forte continuing on. <clears throat> so, uh, you, you know, it's just a, it's just what do you do with the harp here? You know, if you really want that, that kind of playing right in here, you're, you, you know, you're going to have to make more space for it in the dynamic picture than you have got here. So if this is fortissimo, right, or molto forte, and you are going diminuendo to mezzo forte across the board with all the instruments, or even mezzo piano, then the harp will come through beautifully. And then diminuendo to piano here, right? And then like just ending with a big huge roll here, then I think your harp will be audible, and it will also clear up any inconsistencies of dynamics. One last little thing here is that you have been scoring some fairly high notes for bassoon, and they're all playable with a professional player. Um, not so, not so beautiful with, like, say, you know, a semi-pro or amateur player or a student player. Those those high A's and so on. But here you have this kind of dancing. Um, these dancing alternating intervals. And I think that this just really is a clarinet line right in here. I mean, yes, a bassoonist can play this, but will it be all that strong? And, you know, and you've also got the whole issue <clears throat> of the, 
uh, of the trumpet being so close to it, right? So here you got F, right? And then here you got the A, right? So there, so there's a, <clears throat> there is like the, the suggestion of a, um, of a harmony right in here. And now here they are playing the same exact note, right? And I mean, I love team ups between trumpet and bassoon. They're very cool, but on pitch, kind of in this area, you will not really be able to hear the bassoon. It's kind of a throwaway. You would be able to hear the clarinet thickening up the trumpet, though, right? So I just think that it's just stronger. Um, bassoon scoring in its tenor register is always most effective when it is completely exposed, or there's, you know, or maybe it is blending with something that is very easy to blend with, like say violas or or second violins. Or pizzicato, right? So then, then it's pretty effective. But in tenor register, just generally speaking, it's better to have the bassoon playing all by itself rather than thickening up the um, the trumpet line, right? So here you basically you'll just hear the trumpet, and the um, you know unless the players are really listening to each other, they've got some special instructions from the conductor. The the sound of the bassoonist will just absorb right into the trumpet, right? Whereas if you have a uh, clarinet doubling it up, it might be better, or an, or an oboe doubling it up. <clears throat> it might go a little bit better, or even just like your violas, they're not doing anything. They could be doubling up the trumpets right in here. So anyhow, those are my thoughts on this entry. I, I Just once again, a, a unique approach. Uh, just doesn't really sound like anybody else's entry. We're getting a lot of this originality from the entries, and it really is exciting to look at. Uh, I feel like I'm uncovering a, a big treasure trove here, and you know, just going through an enormous chest of um, of <laughs> jewels and and uh, and um, valuable things uh, that was dragged up from the bottom of the ocean from the bottom of everybody's subconscious. So thank you very much, Ramses, for an excellent entry. And now let's go on to the next one. That is one massive score, Troy. And look, you know, once again, no pressure, but if you put this much work into something, and in this case, uh, what people should know is that Troy orchestrated this entire, <laughs> this entire movement, and there's some great stuff in there that I really love to comment on, I think would be very helpful to you as an orchestrator. Uh... But I'm just going to, you know, I just have to limit myself to this first page as a website entry. And, you know, I'm just, just leaving it open. If you're going to put this much work into something, I'm, I'm happy to look at the entire thing. Um, you know, if, if, um, if you have a chance to support on Patreon just for a month or two, whatever, during the, during the uh, challenge period, I don't mind people dropping in and dropping out. It is totally fine. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, just a few overall comments here. Um, SP, just say P. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, I, I've seen the SP dynamic. It's just confusing for a lot of players. Just, just write piano if you're really going to drop down. Yeah. Um, then uh, on on these rolls, okay. So these are sixteenth note beams, right? So this would be a measured sixteenth note tremolo roll. So you know, instead of brrrr, you would be getting or or you know, I can't I can't tongue that fast. But it would be it would you know they're they're basically playing sixteenth note divisions. So. Um, 
All right. Uh, and then, you know, some comments here. You've got these big roles in the harp, and, you know, normally uh, that kind of scoring might have a chance in a big, uh, in a big tutti like this. And the same thing for Celesta, um, which is, you know, something that I just talked about in the previous, uh, the previous evaluation. So, um, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but in this type of orchestration, where there is a ton of very splashy, uh, percussion, the splashiness of the percussion is going to absorb the sound of the harp and the, you know, and then the celesta, of course, is very quiet. So, I mean, you, you might have a little bit of a hint of a sound there, but celesta, you know, you can mark fortissimo all you like for celesta and you'll basically, you'll barely get a mezzo piano out of it compared to the rest of the orchestra's dynamic, right? So, so what is mezzo, you know, what is fortissimo for a celesta is mezzo piano for everybody else. Now, Celesta can play fairly softly, but it can't get down to a whisper, right? So what is um, what is triple piano, what is piano pianissimo for the Celesta it would be more like like piano for the rest. So it's like really, it's this tiny little um, window, uh, this tiny little dynamic range, right? So, uh, you know, writing really, really kind of broad dynamics for your Celesta, you know, I mean, it's it's wishful thinking, and Celesta players will appreciate any information that you give them, but they have a limited range of what they can do, right? So a lot of what you're doing in here is kind of pianistic sort of scoring, right? Or or is is taking the approach of something that is more pianistic. So I would say, if you need that kind of that kind of um, percussive sound looking at piano in the in the scope of orchestral scoring as a percussion instrument right hammers hitting strings then what you really need is something that with a lot more energy a lot more power than harp or celesta in passages like this right like if you were to do like an like if you were to have this scored so that there was a big upsweep on the harp in the last few beats or the last couple of beats leading up to this e then you would hear that right but with this just the just the sound of the flutes and oboes and and uh, violins and violas alone would be enough to to just cover this. And of course, the the celesta sounding like anything is anybody's guess, especially in its lower register, is very very easily muffled by other instruments. So yeah, so I would say like maybe try something like vibraphone or um, or glockenspiel or um, uh, xylophone, you know, the, all that that is that just brings in a very very um, a, abrupt, dry character to the music. So I don't know if that's what you want there, but there, you know, there are ways of scoring this. You know, if I were to work on you, like if I were to turn this into a big orchestration lesson, there would be a bunch of options that we could discuss. But I, I can't discuss them all. But just watch out for this kind of um, this kind of pianistic scoring. You know, the impulse to do that. Just try to see how much you can do without that creeping into the music and then when you when you add celesta and harp make sure that they've got lots of sonic elbow room like for instance right here you're dropping down and here is where big rolls and figuration and so on would be great in the harp maybe a little bit in the celesta as well right but just like so just making sure that everybody was soft throughout okay and then the same thing is true here if you really are bringing everybody down to a soft dynamic. All right, but so now <laughs> let's talk about the uh, evaluation criteria. So <clears throat> we have a concern about the, um, you know, pitch weight in the upper middle register is not a concern. You have very, very full scoring throughout. Uh, thematic material repeating often, perhaps sounding repetitive if orchestrated exactly the same way throughout, right? So you have that possible problem here, right? So you may not see it as a problem. A lot of people watching these videos probably don't. I'm just thinking about, like, you, you know, your own sense of aesthetics, right? So do you, will you always do, like, when you, whenever you run into something like this, where the 
composer reuses the material, will you reuse your own, right? So you, you just have to ask yourself that. Is that always going to be your approach? And if it isn't always going to be your approach, maybe it shouldn't be your, your approach here, right? That's just a thought. Okay. Um, then there's there's one little thing I just want to comment on. You're saying plus piccolo. So I'm not really sure what you mean there. If you're saying like this is like doubling piccolo on the top line or something like that. So, you know, first flute part and piccolo part are the same. So I, I don't understand plus piccolo here. So maybe there is a piccolo... I, I, it's been a while since I looked at this score. I just had a quick look at it now, but I didn't notice whether or not there was a piccolo staff. Hang on a second. I can just solve all this just by looking. Okay, so piccolo, comma, flute. So yeah, so you've got another staff in there that comes up later. Okay, all right. <laughs> no problem. I just wanted to check. So yeah, so plus piccolo. I think that you know, you're saving me some vertical space here, so I understand that. But I would say, just in, in general, just have your blank staff, right? Or here you could say, you could just say um, three flutes, right? Tell me how many at the beginning here. So three flutes, two oboes, right? Or now here you're saying, so how many clarinets in B flat? You got four parts here, right? So that's a massive clarinet section. So would the, would the orchestra be willing to pop for that? And then you have like one part each here on the horns and trumpets, right? And then occasionally you're throwing in some harmony, right? So I would say maybe maybe some of these pitches could be, like instead of just doubling your bassoons, maybe you could be throwing in like the, the just the standard three trombones could be taking care of some of these extra pitches, right? And then it would just make it fuller. Uh, in the middle here. So, I mean, there's nothing, like, in, in terms of the orchestration, there's nothing that really doesn't work here. It's just, um, you, know, you know, giving consideration to um, to the fact that, like, everything is accented all the time, right? So, like, maybe we don't need as many accents as we think, right? Maybe we could let up on the accents during certain phrases and so on. We don't always have to import all of the articulation details from the piano score is you know just a just a suggestion there all right and then the moving on to the next criterion um we've got the concern about melodic development going quite high um and you know right in here is where you could be bringing in your piccolo Right, so the piccolo could be coming in over the top here and going to its high D, which isn't that big of an ask. Okay, but you know, still the way that you've scored this, it does, uh, you know, that it does suggest the overtones, and you're using the um, the natural tendency of the flute to be absorbed by the strings, and for there to be a big kind of color color blending. Um, so, so that uh, it all works fine for me. All right. And then accompaniment figures, you have chosen, just like the last entrant, uh, you've chosen not to have the leaping patterns, but to have the sort of yet da da this kind of approach, not, not as repeated, not as many repeated notes as in that entry, but, but something similar. I kind of, I kind of like the idea of, you know, bump, da 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 plunk, right? I like that like that whole idea. That's very cool. Yeah, you know, um, you know, just in general, tell us when you are going to two voices on a, excuse me, two parts on a single voice, right? So here, if this is meant to be two flutes, say ah to. If this is meant to be two oboes, tell me ah to here, right? If this is meant to be two trumpets, tell me ah to. It just helps, you know, it's sort of like musical punctuation. Um, you know, when leaving out information like like plurals, like imagine reading um, a sentence that was about like people going somewhere, but it had no sense of plural, right? Like the the connotation was that there was that there was uh, there were several actors, there were several um, um, there were several subjects contributing to one object, right? 
but I didn't have any clue in the way that the language was framed to tell me whether or not that was one people, one person, two people, three people, right? So that's just kind of another form of musical punctuation to tell me, you know, ah, two. It's just like say, okay, so two people are playing. And so that I can tell that this is balanced, right? So without it, I might think, well, you know, uh, trumpets are playing over the oboes right here and, you know, all right. So it, I just, it just helps me to help you better. Okay, so uh, there is some similarity as well between these two parts, right? So we're once again seeing the kind of mirroring of the scoring approach, which has got a few differences, right? So it's not totally a copy-paste situation. Uh, there's some very neat things in here, though, like the trills right here by the clarinet. Uh, I mean, how many clarinets? If this is four clarinets trilling, that is that would just be an amazing sound. Uh, it's just the kind of thing that I would want, like, say, violas or second violins to double, right? I, I would want there to be more uh, more bustle to the trill here, because otherwise I feel it might get swallowed by everything else that's going on, especially the snare drum and the tambourine. That kind of ch -ch 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 sort of sound, it will, you know, it tends to absorb things going, yeah, 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 like a, like a trill. Uh, it's, you know, it's, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, it's like that's another possible tip. The absorptive quality, you know, the, um, you know, the, the ability to absorb things that instruments based on white noise. Um, and I'm, and I'm always reminded of the, um, of the Peter Gabriel album, the Melting Face album that has no symbols on it, right? Uh, and there's something incredibly clear. Uh, the drums are not always the most interesting in terms of the interaction between the different parts, but the um, but like there's a certain channel, a certain slot, acoustically or sonically that goes through those recordings that's very very clear because of the lack of that white noise. All right, so here you know we're ending up running up to this top E, and, and here we run into that problem of which I feel that, you know, you can solve, like if your piccolo part goes up to the E, right, and there's some other factors as well, then the drop-off signals that this is the beginning of a new phrase, right? So the phrase ends here, but if it's all the same E, right, instead of being high E and then jumping down like it does in the piano part, Right, as opposed to right. So, so these are groups. These these phrases are rhythmically grouped. Uh, second beat to the first beat of the next bar, right? Da 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 da. And then here we have um, a dovetailing phrase. Right, and then just continues on. Okay, so I think that there was a little bit of an error here in the pitches as you transcribe them. Right, so it's supposed to drop down. Da 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 da. Right. And then the whole concern about you know relentlessness is not an issue because of the you know because of the broader scoring. You are going really high up here with your trumpets. This is really a, tr excuse me, with your trombones. This is really a trumpet kind of a part. And in fact, I would, I would just say throughout all this, you know, you're, you're having that high sound and then you're kind of expecting a softer sound as you go higher and higher with your trombone. So I think that if you really want control, then this part right in here should be like a, um, a horn part. And these parts in here should be trumpet parts, right? I, I, and then then this doubling here of the bassoons could be in the trombones. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's just a, just more appropriate. And then just, you know, going here up to this, you know, this screaming high C. Um, you know, it, I mean, you're, you're saying high C with a tenuto mark on it. So this is going to basically bury what's going on with the horns. So this, it would be better for this to be a horn part, right? Um, or or a trumpet part, with for even more control. Uh, but yeah, but the way that it is now, it's really going to push through the balance of everything else that's going on here. Uh, and then right here, you got this wonderful uh, line that dives downwards. 
Uh, and here's where I would say, you know, make this double stops with your violas and and double this with your cellos because otherwise this is just thrown away, You're kind of wasted. Um, yeah, so so maybe a few incorrect notes here in the transposition. So like like the way that you have got it scored, we don't feel the sense of of motion through the line, right? It just sort of repeats itself, and then like so without that, without scoring it the way that it that Faya scores it, like with a change in the in the pitches, then when we go to here, we're not feeling the sense of of progression through the melody. Right? Uh, and then then you know, this will just be massive right in here. This. Um, all of all of this staccato and marcato and so on, but you have shown me what you're leading to in the next page, and I feel that this this does connect fairly well. Uh, driving staccato, transitioning smoothly into the next passage, and so on. I, I think that that's great. So uh, yeah, so so just like a really worthy entry, and you know so much good stuff in it that I don't really have time to talk about, but just to to warn you about you know some. You know some things. I think that in previous uh, challenges, I spent a lot of time talking about notes that were clearly out of the range of the instrument. And with this particular round of evaluations for 2021, I appear to be talking a lot about notes that that instruments can play, but if played in the way that the orchestrator is asking, might possibly be overbalancing or um, in some other way not blending into the texture very well like this incredibly high C on the trombone um, or uh, or just like not being all that musical like you know sending sending your um, your violins all the way up to E an octave higher than this this isn't something that you did but I've seen in other um, in other entries so, you know, the, the things that, that can work, you know, and might not even be all that bad sounding, but are the ideal, right? So, so it would, you know, is it like, you might ask yourself, what would Ravel do? You know, would, would Ravel send everybody up to that high E? Probably not unless he really had that effect in mind of just kind of, of, of real tension and scratchiness, possible, possible scratchiness um, um, or, or squeakiness. So... So, anyways, I mean, just just really a great job, but but um, yeah, you know, once again, I would love to, uh, you know, I'd love to look at at all of the entries all of the way through of what everybody had to offer. So, and and that is available if you want it. All right. So, you know, if you feel that it's worth your time to orchestrate the whole thing and just send me the first part, then then I'm honored. Okay, but. You know, I don't want you to feel like that is the end of the road if you have, if you need more feedback. Okay, so with that, I will thank you for a nice solid entry, and let's move on to the next one. What a satisfying entry, Demetrio. Just really pushing a lot of buttons. <laughs> and and also checking a lot of boxes in my uh, personal list of pet peeves. Um, to, boxes to avoid. So um, we've been talking a little bit about harp. Uh, focusing a bit on harp in this uh, in this run of evaluations here. So So let's take a look and see what works and why it works. Okay, and, and where you need to be a little careful. So, um, there's a lot of dynamic mixing right in here, and I think it's completely unnecessary. Um, I would say, uh, realistically speaking, everybody could be piano here, right? Or mezzo piano. And then, of course, your harp should never be marked lower than everybody else. 
Now, maybe things are going to balance a little bit better if you do this kind of dynamic mixing. It'll balance a little bit better in your uh, mock-up. But uh, these differences between the different players and balancing themselves is for the players to decide. Oh, that's another orchestration tip I should write down. So just these tiny little, you know, like the, the flute player is pulling back a little bit so that the oboe player is not going to be overwhelmed and so on. Those kinds of things are really for the player to to insert into the um, into the mix, right? So it would be better to orchestrate it so that all the parts work great, more or less mark the same dynamic, and then just special cases such as the harp are marked up a little bit because just just out of the realization that they are not they are at a disadvantage, right? So in this case, the harp really does. You, know, you cannot mark piano here. It will disappear into the texture of everything else that's going on, even though it's sounding great in the mock-up, right? Just really, you know, it should be as loud or louder, right? Um, so here I would say mark everybody piano and mark the harp and the uh, oboe, the solo oboe poco forte, right? And then... You can do your crescendo here, and you don't have to tell us where you're going dynamically. Just do the crescendo, and then this will hit like a hammer blow. All right, so that leads to this big glissando, and you know, as I've mentioned, you do not need to write in the first seven pitches of your glissandos. Just have a starting, have a starting note and an ending note, and put in your glissando line in between and have a pedal diagram like this, right? That's what the, that's all the harpist needs. They don't want to read all these tiny little letters or these tiny little notes. They'd rather read everything written out alphabetically or they would or a pedal diagram telling them where to how to set their pedals for the glissando because everything else is just a waste of your time and of their time to just sort of read through as I'm seeing some of these little um, pedal guides are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and harder and harder to read. And more, you know, kind of more apologetic looking, right? But you don't have anything to apologize for. Just write the start note and the end note. Okay, um, and you know, just just as I mentioned before, uh, this is a this is a fast tempo, but it's not all that fast. So you might want to encompass a much broader range, right? So I would say E an octave below this, B an octave above that, and then you get this beautiful huge sweep, right? The bigger the sweep, the more effective in this kind of scoring. So, so, so far, you know, with adjusting the dynamics here, maybe changing some of the philosophy there, uh, the harp scoring is good, the harp scoring is good, except for, you know, writing in the all those pitches. And then here, um, we've, we just have a slight problem, and, and that is you're going loud, 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 like fortissimo, really loud, really loud, really loud, really loud. Ba, 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 da, 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 da. It's a what? Mezzo piano against this forte? You're never going to hear that harp, especially at non arpeggiando, right? So non arpeggiando, it's more like a piano part, right? And and this the pian the harp just does not have the weight to come through, even though it is positioned underneath, it's positioned out of the way of these notes in the melody, but it's still it just is not strong enough to carry the and, and I would say the strings too, they're just they're just not really contributing right here, right? So I would say just don't don't feel afraid to to make this go softer. Right? It's okay. It's fine. It's fine if this drops down to mezzo forte or mezzo piano. That's totally that's totally alright. However, the big concern still is that you got um the wash of sound, the reverberation of this loud brass is going to, it's going to be sitting in the concert hall for you know a half a second or a second, and it will bury the sound of soft harp coming in here. So that's your other concern, right? Okay. So now, um, so now let's use the evaluation criteria. So like, isn't isn't it interesting how just exploring the role of the harp can bring out a bunch of other concerns in the orchestration, right? But they're worth talking about because it's a very worthy score, Demetrio. Really, just so great to look at. And and you know, I've seen your scores over the past few years. I I just have a very strong recollection of 
of looking at your at your contributions and so on and and you being a member of the community and just you're just really becoming a very powerful orchestrator here so um yeah so if you have a standard uh if you're going to have a standard layout of horns you don't do not need to tell us one two and three and four right it's just completely unnecessary it's sort of like the upward um the upward wavy line for a roll with a pointer on it right so it's unnecessary if it's the default so if this is the default then you do not need one two three and four like we'll just know that that's the way that you're you know you're positioning it correctly you're doing it fine so there's kind of nothing to worry about there um and i do like the way that you are um your um harmonization here you're doubling the root of the triad and that is a really good way to go because like the higher pitches are going to stand out really nice and clear so it's the lower pitch that needs to be doubled even scored high like this right it's just just a much stronger way to approach it all right <laughs> and good use of bass clarinet and and so on and contrabassoon and it's just just really cool stuff now, one other possibly unnecessary thing is you do not have to mark uh, these big down bows, right? Because there's there's zero chance that these players would play anything else on a fortissimo accent at the beginning of the piece, right? They are going to, they're always going to do a down bow. If you mean like a big, long, zooming note, then write in a tenuto, right? So that's that will tell them the same exact thing. So zoom, right? But that's not really going to happen because you have a big, um, these big quadruple stops. So you, you might, the, the bow might follow through in a sort of a zooming fashion, but the, um, but the execution of the, of the bow having to cross four strings is not going to have that united sound, right? So, um, so it's just, so I just I just feel that like you know think about it right think about it a little bit but you don't have you don't need these down bows at all all right so now let's talk about the criteria okay pitch weight in the upper register of the orchestra not a big concern I like the way that you varied the different um, contexts of where the pitch weight is you know like higher right in here full in both of these sections starting off with a lot of low emphasis and then. Um, and then going to higher pitches right in here, and then letting things evolve and so on. Just really nicely done. Good proportions. So that leads us to the first of the specific criteria, and that is thematic material repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive. That is totally not a concern, because even though you have some similar wind uh, orchestration, you're really changing things around. You know, going from arco to pizzicato on the second beat of the second bar. And then here you have the strings jumping in to double the winds and having this uh, bum. Da, 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 da. You know, that that really, really works. Uh, the triplets. <laughs> Boom. Da, 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 da. Boom, da 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 da, right? That really works great. Um, I almost wonder if it's coming from too quiet of a place, right? Uh, here you have like forte piano. I mean, it's good to it is good to come from somewhere. Yeah, maybe the crescendo could be a little shorter, right? So you could be forte by the time you got to here. I don't know. I mean, it, it just feels a little, it feels a little underpowered. Um, but I don't know. I leave it as, leave it as is. If you're going to take this further, it's fine. Now, our next question is melodic development. You have covered that problem, piccolo and so on. I would say just watch out if you're going to be doubling at the octave and then dropping off. You know, ba 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 ba. What? Right, and then and then like you know, we'll feel the drop down. 
to this and then this coming in again. But I mean, you're keeping things nice and soft. So, I mean, I can see how you're balancing this so that the piccolo is sort of like the overtones of the oboe, right? So, I mean, I can see the rationale behind what you're doing in here in terms of the texture, but still the harp is too, way too soft. Uh, but speaking of the harp and the clarinets, we've got that accompaniment figure, and I think that works really, really well. And I love the little touch of pizzicato right in here, supporting the melody. So that's very, very cool. And the little, you know, the flutes helping out with the accompaniment behind the melody. And once again, we've got repeated notes in the place of uh, some of the accompaniment, right? We've got that, ja, 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 ja. but we still have the accompaniment figure, bassoons, pizzicato, lower strings. Uh, I, that all works really great. It's fine with me. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's it's a, also a good realization of the accompaniment figure that doesn't cross too far, right? You notice like the trade-off between clarinets and flutes and and so on. Um, and then, of course, harp, which is very, very easy to cover those pitches. And then we just run up to the top. Uh, now, now, here we go with, like, going all the way up to the very, very, very high E, right? Unsupported by piccolo. Here's where I think going with the flow probably would work. Maybe coming in on this A sharp right in here on piccolo and then doubling the violins all the way through because like the smaller the um the smaller the string length on that high e string the more the violinists the first violinists are going to be relying on the overtones from below in say um the um the flutes and the second violins to to fill in their sound and and make it feel more secure and more convincing, right? So, you know, without any kind of doubling by the piccolo, you have that issue. I mean, it still works great. It's like there's there's nothing really wrong with it. It's just like, do you want that that very high, you know, that very high, almost squeaky sound going up to those incredibly high pitches? Once again, this is, uh, you know, I'm running into situations where something is less beautiful, right? It's not necessarily wrong or impossible, but it's just not, you know, it doesn't have that kind of lovely sense that, you know, wonderful balanced orchestration and everything else that you're going for, especially in passages like this, right? Okay, and then this is a cool option. Brass, and trading off to uh, winds, harp, and strings. And once again, I... I said, you know, that there are ways to balance this so that the harp comes through. See, like, you know, when you're, when you're going forte, mezzo forte, mezzo piano, but the harp is mezzo piano all the way through, like, you're not really going to hear the harp until about right here, right? So there has to be some kind of balancing in here um, to, make it, to make it more rational to use the harp, or then just don't use the harp. But the, um, the harmony here in the strings is just has to be stronger if it's going to add any kind of support. Right in here, I would give this to the first horn player. And, you know, they are the going to be the person with the most control. And the they're going to be the player that feels the most responsible in their position with the rest of the orchestra to get everything absolutely right. Right? So they're playing this uh, sounding middle C at the bottom, right? And their overtones from that C are enough to just swallow the harp. And the uh, and these softer strings above them, so it really should be the other way around, right? The horn should be mezzo piano, and the strings should be mezzo forte, or louder if they're going to be supporting right in here, All right? And then see, like here you have mezzo piano diminuendo to mezzo piano. I don't know what that means, right? Maybe copy paste on the dynamics here. Maybe you intended this to be forte, right? Or maybe you started off thinking about this as being all softer, but then then when you started scoring this, you thought, oh, well, let's make this strong, and then you didn't come back here and fix the dynamics. Maybe that's the situation. Anyways, but this this needs some balancing. So it just has some issues, right? So, but that, And that's a first horn part. I would say in situations where you have something exposed and it really has a critical function to the rest of the music, just default to the first player. That is their job. You know, they're, they are the people who are the most involved in finessing. And 
you know, it's it's not it is no insult to the rest of the orchestra, the rest of the players, the rest of the seats if they are not getting those parts all the time, right? You would give this to the third if the first had got a big solo coming up, right? If the first if there's going to be some beautiful melodious thing or or if they're going to have to if they're going to be accompanying say this um this marcato staccato then i would say yeah okay the third player playing this and you know and giving the first player some time to get their lip together or just to focus on the solo coming up all right um so continuing on uh, we come to our last concern, and that is maintaining a driving staccato, transitioning smoothly into the next passage. I mean, it's all working fine, but it's a little strange here. You, you've got a staccato strings. You know, we've got different... You've got this big emphasis here, pizzicato. You don't need to... This can all be the same dynamic, but and the accent is enough to bring out the pizzicato. It does not need to be marked up a dyna dynamic degree. And the same thing is true here. See, like you have piano uh, crescendo to forte, and I think I think what you're wanting to do is starting with a mixed sound that is more strings, and then end up with winds here, right? Well, I mean, yeah, okay. I, if you really want that effect, then that's fine. Okay. Uh, and, and I respect this you know, transition, like clarinets transitioning to, or first clarinet transitioning to first bassoon, and uh, oboe transitioning to uh, trumpet. So if you want this to be seamless, then this dynamic here should be mezzo forte. Then you will feel, you know, the line will feel like it is, you know, that it is seamless. Right, but if you really want to feel that entrance of the trumpet right in here, in addition to completing the line, then yeah, leave it at forte. You know, otherwise, I don't know what else I could say about this. I think it's really well done. Um, you know, once again, uh, I mean, I'm picking it apart, but I pick apart everybody's entry, whether it's ready for the stands or not. So. Uh, it's just how much can I help anybody in the time that I've got? You know, these brief. Uh, 10 or 20 minutes that I can set aside to help each person. So, um, yeah, it's just really excellent work. Really, really enjoyed this. Now, let's continue on to the next entry. So much intrigue, Cameron. It's, <laughs> you know, it's, this is like one of the sneakiest, uh, most um, devious entries <laughs> that I've received so far. Uh, there's just so much calculation and, and interaction between the parts. Um, it's a really great way to wrap up this, um, <laughs> this collection of six entries. All very strong, all very big, uh, and you know this last one is kind of showing us a, a new way of of approaching the material. And you know, I mean, from the very beginning, you are addressing a lot of the concerns, all of the concerns that I have in my criteria. And you know, that is to you know to avoid being stuck in any one register. Um, to avoid repeating any any approach, and like you you avoid even repeating pairs, so you're going way past my entry, <laughs> my particular example of this orchestration, by just just taking a different approach every every pair of bars. There's hardly you know there is almost there's no repeat really essentially 
to anything. Um, it's all done differently across the board. And what's cool is that you have used these little hooks, yep, up, up, um, to take you to the next place, right? So like right in here, you're going yet, yeah, da, 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 yum, and you end up with the oboes and the English horn being that high B pitch, right? And then here, um, the pluck, 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 pluck sets up the uh, accompaniment pattern. Okay, and then here, um, dun, 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 and then the pizzicato on top, pluck, 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 sets up these higher pitches, these higher Bs, right? Um, so, I mean, the only cliff that you drop off of is right here, right? Uh, and yet, uh, you have these lower pitches, uh, the trumpets and the trombones, uh, setting up their their continuation here uh, of that next part. So yeah, um, this may might have been accidental. Leave out the um, extra uh, rehearsal marks. I might have actually done that while I was I might have been editing this score down to look the right height. So anyways, just yeah, people don't add. Um, just leave in the rehearsal marks the way that I have them in the in the templates and in the um, in the the score with audio uh, that I release um, at the beginnings of these orchestration challenges. Okay, so <clears throat> so uh, let's just really quickly address uh, the harp in the room and here, like all of this scoring, like you don't need to tie that. That's the only thing that you kind of didn't need to do. Like the, I, I see what you're doing here is like you really want that first note to be, you know, to be its own thing. But it's you're going to get the same sound anyways because the player is not going to um, they they're not going to damp the uh, and you know and I also see like you're carrying forward the pitch because you're concerned about it reaching the second beat right in here right so that's okay I I don't know I mean you know what it would it would be better. Yeah, I, I mean, there are some ways around this, but I, I don't want to get into it too much here. But I will, I think I will address this in a in a tip. This would be a fantastic tip for you know how to how to score very simple art, um, glissandos when you end up when you're sweeping up to like the second or third beat. Okay, so like there are ways to notate it that are kind of you know a little simpler than this. Um. Pedal marking right in here it should right, could kind of go right here, right? That's where you want it. Always try to have it, you know, if, if the first thing that you do is a glissando, then put it right over the glissando. And the, you know, the harpist has got all these bars to, like, as the orchestra is starting, let's say that they're sight reading it cold, they've got all this time to, to set the pedals and get ready just to do a very simple glissando. It's like one of the simplest things you can do on a harp. Now, right in here, um, everything's forte, right? And then piano, crescendo to forte, forte, uh, pizzicato, and arco. So why is your harp mezzo piano? Now, maybe you can hear that fine in your mock-up, but no way is that going to come through uh, playing against these uh, clarinets and, and bass clarinet. It's just, it's not, it's just not strong enough. Right, it's, there's so so. This has really got to be like marked forte or louder, right? But I mean, it's it's still so um, it is so sparsely scored right in here. Like all it, all that the harp has got to do is play alongside your clarinets, so it will come through even though the clarinets are marked rather loud. However, if they were if you were if they're playing against horns, forget it. You couldn't hear it, right? might be good to sort of hold off on the crescendo until later if you're going to have harps right in here. So I would say like, you know, um, maybe if the if the clarinets dropped down to mezzo forte and then they went crescendo here and then you had your harp coming in here forte, you'd have a beautiful, perfect balance. All right. So another little thing um, is completely unnecessary to to write symbols suspended or clash symbols, symbol pair, with the X note head, okay? The X note head thing is really more of a, um, 
It's more of like a crossover or a drum kit kind of a thing. And it seems to be insinuating itself into film scores and uh, and concert scores via perhaps Dorico or or other uh, other kinds of scoring where it's the default. Don't just like don't you, the players do not need it, right? So it's a question: Do the players? Is it clearer to the player? All that they care about is this, right? Symbols, right? And you could say like suspended or, you know, or symbol pair, right? Or clash, right? Right here. So I would say like, um, yeah, just, just leave out the X note heads. All right. So now <laughs> let's get to the nitty gritty. Oops. Uh, let's get to the nitty gritty. Sorry about that. Um, of this uh, of this evaluation. So discussing, um, once again, some more criteria. So I'm not even going to bother talking about the, the you know, those concerns, um, those first couple of concerns. Melodic development soaring quite high. Um, just, you know, just as long as you're aware that the piccolo is going to come in here from nowhere, right? So bum, 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 da, 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 da. you know what I mean? It's, it's, the, it'll enter an octave higher than everybody else. And, of course, absorbing the uh, very penetrating overtones of all of these instruments. Uh, you've got all of your upper winds playing in unison here. Uh, and then the piccolo playing above will, will kind of, you know, will, will bring out those overtones very strongly. Now, this is kind of strange. Right, so there's like there's no follow through of this upper line, but I mean I mean it works if you you know and and it also works with the way that you are moving the direction of the music right that like you are kind of directing the different registers to different places. So I'll give you a pass on that here, right? Okay. Um, then there's like the other concern, the melodic development going high. Here you take it all the way to the top. And it's interesting that you do the glissando afterwards. <laughs> right. Um, and, and, you know, and, uh, and the same thing here. You're like, you're not glissandoing to the downbeat, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yep, bum, bum, bum. That's really cool. Okay. <laughs> the only... The only possible thing that I would say watch out for is like glissando through this phrase and then, you know, to bump, 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 bump. Is this setting up too much of a repetitive expectation? Right? Are you turning this into a recognizable phrase to be reiterated here? And then the, then the other thing, of course, is that you're really not giving yourself very much distance to glissando. You could have a much beautiful, broader glissando from B an octave lower to C an octave higher, and just really get a huge, glorious sweep. And then the same thing here, you know, I think that this is really like, at this rate, it's almost like a scale. You know, I mean, it like it's sounding great in your mock up, but it, you know, I would say two octaves below, right? Just go to your, go to that low C and then just rip up, you know, if the harp has got it. All right, so uh, continuing on. Um, so let's talk about the accompaniment style. I think nicely uh, scored throughout it here. I like the, you know, pushing on this B. I think that's a, that is a very cool choice. Uh, doubling with how many horns? Is this first? Right, and is this like the second horn or something like that? How many horns on each part? So this is definitely something you would not need to double. So I would assume that this would be first horn. And then this could actually be second horn, so it could just be a second voice on this part here. Otherwise, your scoring is pretty nice. I mean, and then here, if these are intended to be ah two, they should be split up. The This should be... Um, or excuse me, they should be added together, right? So 
this should be a B fifth in both parts, right? So you have F sharp being played by your first horn, and then B on the same staff being played by the second horn, and then the same the same exact pitch as third horn on the F sharp, B on the fourth horn. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, third horn on the F sharp, fourth horn on the B. And then you know continuing on. Now, now would you want to go to um, to A four horns right in here, right? So if you really only intend for there to be two horns here, it should be first and second, not not first and third. Maybe I don't I don't know what you which horns you intend. And if you intend this to only be like A two horns, then this should just be first and second sharing this, and then going to an interval here. Um, and that's really all you need, you, despite the fact that you have a certain mass of sound here. If you have that B be too penetrating, you just have this. You end up with this massive sounding E, really grounding everything, and and maybe maybe like sort of shouting compared to everybody else. I mean, mostly this orchestration works, although. Uh, it's a little inconsistent. I mean, you you are trying to be careful about like one and two and a two and so on. Um, I think everybody would know immediately that this was the first player on top and the second player on the bottom. You would really only need to mark that it if we were opposite, right? Like if you had wanted the second player on top and the first player on the bottom for some reason, right? And you would have to justify that with good scoring. So here you don't need to mark a two again. We already know that it's a two. And then the same thing here, like no need to tell us that the top part is the first and the bottom part is the second. And, you know, same thing, same thing here. We know, right? And you don't have to split these into separate voices. They can all be first voice, um, just just scored as, um, as intervals, very much the same way that you would do that here, because they're all the same rhythmic uh, you know, they, all, they have all the same rhythmic value, so they might as well just be stated as intervals just the same way that you would do that here in the bassoons. And, yeah, and once again, completely, completely um, unnecessary. So that leads us to a discussion of the phrasing right in here, and I, I feel that you have done that really, really well. Like, there's, there's no worry about the upper middle register being relentless, obviously, because you have changed around the registers so beautifully coming up to here uh, and change the context of the scoring constantly the colors and the techniques and everything are all changing the articulation styles are changing if you're going to be that fastidious about it then you should also know that you don't have to have accents on everything just because they were in the piano part right so all right so um i like this rising up to a fortissimo and then dropping to piano, and then you know crescendo to forte, very very cool. And I like the trading off, right? Um, oboes, um, unison with your clarinets, and then octaves, flutes and clarinets, bum 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 bum, and then flutes going on with uh, oboe and uh, English horn, this is gonna be hugely fat if you have uh, Atu oboes in this register and English horn and first violins all together. So I would say make this your first, uh, make this first oboe only, right? First or second oboe. Now, do you really want this? Duh, uh, because uh, that's what you're asking for, right? Like you, the same thing, da, right? Or bia, because that's what it's going to sound like. And then here, like you phrase things differently, because like you're thinking about Boeing, which is cool. Um, so, you know, you just really, you know, or do you want that, like, see here, you have ba, 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 ba. So wouldn't that be better of a, a better articulation style for here? Da da rather than da uh, da uh. All right, then yep up 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 up. This is all really fun. Uh so is this solo clarinet? Is it a two clarinets? Because if if it's a two clarinets, you're gonna have that phased sound, right? It's gonna have a slight um um uh, 
almost like a there there'll be a, almost a mechanical sound to it, right? Um, so you've got these parts playing in harmony. That's all cool, and then you bring in a little bit of English horn here, but then the English horn drops out, like, and there isn't really kind of a transition to another timbre from the English horn. So that will you know the, just the it's sudden presence and then absence is going to be heard especially if you're pushing this right where the english horn has got some penetration compared to the throat tones of the clarinet or clarinets right and i don't know if this is clarinet or clarinets that just the, that context itself as i was saying before um telling me uh two or just one player or whatever um that is just like plural or singular in a sentence right is, is, is that important And then bassoons. Is this two bassoons? One bassoon? I would say, like, just like if you are having these instruments play together, having three players, like one bass clarinetist and two bassoon players, you end up with a very, very solid sound. But it's going to be really noticeable. It's the same way that you're bringing in the English horn here for just a second, right? Um, so you're bringing in the bassoons, and then they continue on. But just suddenly, the the um, the timbre will thick it, thicken up very, very strongly, right? Um, with the um, and and I and I also see what you're doing here. You, you know, I don't think that I don't understand. Like that, you know, clarinet family together, clarinet family with harp, adding the thicker texture of the of the. Uh, double reeds and so on. So, like you know, you're shifting from sound to sound here, um, but I'm you know just be aware of the 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 shifting will uh, kind of tend to, um, it, you know, it 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 might get to be a bit much with particular kinds of combinations. Is the is the warning, right? But this is really cool in here, clarinet or clarinets plus first violins and flutes above. Now the flutes are going to get absorbed into the sound of the violins unless they play out, right? If you have the, if you have this coming in at a at a hotter dynamic, but just in general, I would say that you get way more control and interest if you can bring down the the dynamics, right? Ba 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 da 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 You know what I mean? So like if you can, it just like if it's going to be loud all the way through, right? Maybe you get little, you get less of, you get less ingenuity out of it, right? And you're valuing ingenuity, calculation, um, and just you know wonderful contrast between things. So I would say, I think you're missing an opportunity here by keeping everything loud. Right, so what if you just went down to piano here, delayed this crescendo, kept this piano, then just leave this mezzo piano or even mezzo forte, and then you know, you really get beautiful uh, harp right in there. And and it you know don't mark it, you know leave off the staccatos. They're they're kind of they don't apply here, right? Like staccato harp playing. It, you know, the player really kind of needs to be able to kind of stop each note as they go, right? And it just is sort of interferes. Better just to slur it, right? And then you just get that lovely lush sound against the staccatos. And then crescendo here. And then have these players come in, and I would say dovetail out, right? So just have them end on a, like in this case, end on a on an eighth, right? So that it, you know, so that it, like the, it has more of a sense of completion to it. Or just continue on the English horn, right? And then you solve some of that problem. Anyhow, great score. Uh, you know, I could just keep talking about it all day. <laughs> uh, so much fun. I love the, the tuba part in here. I, li I like the way that it supports. It's such a great sound. Tuba plus double bass. And then, you know, these little notes in here accompanying first arco and then pizzicato. That's all great. I would say... To get a better blend with a pizzicato here, there's just kind of no need for this to all be accented. But anyways, better blend with a pizzicato, I would say staccato, right? So throw in the staccato and then the articulation will match better, right? Rather than being bum, bum, you get the pluck and you get bum, bum. 
yeah, so one last little thing, and I'm glad I remembered this. Okay, and that is the brass scoring in here. I think the horn is incredibly effective here. This should be first horn, right? Just, just a single horn, not A2. And, and right in here, I would score this as first and second horn, not as first as what whatever horn and whatever horn. I don't know. I don't know who is doing what here. So yeah, so this should be first and second horn working together because they have the best. Um, like those players sit next to each other and they can completely finesse their intonation and articulation together. Right? They just really they they are in sync in a way that the first and the third are not, right? So you want your first and second players to be sitting next to each other. It's a, it's a mistake to think that the second player is not as good as the third player, right? It's like, it's like what is your role? Like there, there are things that the second player is good at that the third player is never going to touch, and they know it, right? And it's because the, the second player is like the right-hand man. It's kind of like looking at the hobbits, right? You know, it's completely like the hobbits. Uh, in in Lord of the Rings, you know, Frodo is the first horn, Sam is the second horn, right? And then Merry is the third horn, and Pippin is the fourth horn, right? Just kind of like doing, like kind of the stuff at the bottom, and and um, you know, working their way through, and occasionally fluffing it, right? But the the um, the relationship of the first and the second, you know, the Frodo and Sam relationship, just really supporting. Merry knows he is never going to get as close to. The, to Frodo as Sam is, and that's not his job. You know, he's a fellow aristocrat with Frodo, right? He's the he's going to inherit the mastership of Brandy Hall, right? That's someday, right? And just just as how Frodo, you would expect in normal course of life, would become the master of Bag End, which he does in the at the beginning of the book, and um, and. Uh, you, you know that is that is something that that Mary is not going to take away from him, right? He's going to go be part of his own little sub country on the edge of the Shire. So yeah, so there it's it's a so try to what I'm trying to say here is just to try to score those intimate parts where where getting the harmony just right and the articulation just right. Just have the first and the second do it. All right. Or the, or the third and the fourth if you are saving up your first for something. Okay, so anyways, but the this, I would say, is just a slight, um, there's something slightly uneven about the dovetailing going from your first trumpet part to your flutes and oboes. And I would say, like, what you need here is you need a diminuendo, right? So that this is, I would say diminuendo into it, or diminu sorry, diminuendo out of your phrase, and then crescendo into, right? So starting maybe mezzo forte, crescendo to forte. And then also this line below, you either need to leave it out. Like I can see you're, you're kind of continuing on from your trombone here, right? So, so you can't really, like the, the way that you've set up these octaves, you can't really get rid of that line. But the biggest thing that makes this feel like a, a sudden jolt or a drop off is the fact that this line does not continue, right? And you got a clarinet player that's just not doing anything right here, right? So <clears throat> third trumpet or second trumpet should dovetail into the clarinets playing in octaves here, I think. So, anyways, that's just a just a thought right in there, and that you don't have to double them at octaves uh, with your strings. Very cool score. So, <laughs> um, wow, what a, what a great collection of scores. Just, this is the kind of scoring that keeps me going. You know what I mean? Um, and, and that's true whether I'm looking at a score where, you know, like this score and the other, and the past one and a couple others in this were just about ready for the stands, you know. And it's true whether it is, whether a score is in that condition or whether, you know, I have a lot of explaining to do and going and helping and so on. Like both those sides of me, I love sharing. And just the opportunity to help somebody get stronger with their scoring, you know, whether it is at like a very intense little kind of picking apart a score that, you know, that is pretty much together or whether it is laying down some basics of foundational um, thoughts about orchestration. Uh, it 
it is all very fulfilling to me, and I really look forward to this time of year um, with a little bit more dread uh, in terms of the amount of scores that I've been getting. Uh, it has sort of doubled and tripled over the past couple of years as the community has grown, but uh, I'm going to try to keep it going for now, right? We'll just, we'll just see how, how much further we can take this before it gets to be too much. So thanks all. Thanks to everybody here. And, you know, anybody who is still sticking around for this, please give a comment below, especially if you are in this group of orchestrators. Please comment on each other's works with supportive feedback. That would mean so much to me and would be probably the, the biggest deciding factor on whether or not I'm going to do this again. Okay? Thanks all, and I will see you very soon for... Uh, Website entries H. <laughs>